Hello, it's Chloe of Thistle and Burris, and I'm here today to talk about what I read in May of this year, which is 2021. I said in my tweet, I was hoping I'd come up with a snappy subtitle for this month. I don't know if there's going to be one. The only one I could come up with was Menagerie of Meh, because I felt like May was like not a great reading month for me. Like There are books that I really liked, but by and large, I just felt very like listless i really didn't want to be reading i just felt very tired and burnt out so may was not a great reading month for me but i read surprisingly a number of books in that month so i'm going to talk about them today so first up is awakened by moni boyce this was one that i just kind of got out on a whim it's a romance and i got an audio version from my library um, I'd been meaning to read more romances, and so since my library had it and it was convenient, and I was kind of in a phase of like listening to romances while I was doing work, that's what I did. Um, the plot is kind of um, straightforward. There is this protagonist woman, there's this protagonist who's a black woman. She finds out she's some sort of like chosen one. Like she's getting these weird dreams about a vampire who's haunting her and she finds out that she can like see the future and she's supposed to like take down this vampire. And in terms of the romance, it is a black woman, white man romance, which I did not know from the synopsis. I'm a little leery of those. I'm a little wary of those. Um, and had I known that I don't know that I would have picked it up because I wasn't like feeling super duper drawn to the book. Uh, in general, it wasn't really my thing. Oh, sorry, hey, I didn't see everyone. Um, hey, Shay. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Aaron. It's fine if you didn't get a notification. These have just been kind of like on on the cuff, on the off the cuff, kind of on the fly type things. Uh, hey, T. Thanks for stopping by. Um, yeah, these have been kind of last minute, these wrap-up lives. Um, so I listened to the audiobook, which wasn't a great decision for this one. The voice actors were, like, fine when they were saying their lines, but when they were saying, like, the love interest lines, it got a little weird. Like, the woman sounded a little bit like she's doing, like, an Alan Rickman impression when she's talking in the man's point of view. The guy kind of sounded like he was doing a Barney impression when he was doing some of the woman's lines. So that really wasn't um, a big selling point because I listened to it. And overall, the plot didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Like there's this conflict because the love interest is like the main character's guardian and he's not supposed to be dating or having sex with her. And he can't tell her for reasons that are never disclosed. And so, like, that's this whole conflict where she's interested in him and he can't date her. And um, for whatever reason, he doesn't tell her that. And I didn't really get why, because I felt like even if he had told her, they could still, like, have conflict about that decision. Like, if I was interested in someone and they're like, I can't because of my job, I'd be like, can you quit your job? I mean... Does your job have to know? Like, this seems kind of weird. Like, surely you can work around this. So I didn't really understand why they didn't talk about it. Um, in terms of me le being leery of like black woman, white man romances, I didn't really feel like there's anything in this book that was fetishizing. -y. It's just like something I'm like, kind of like tense and on the lookout for when I read this type of stuff. So like, um, that was like something that I was attracting from the experience just in general. Like that wasn't anything that there wasn't really anything the book could have done differently in terms of that. Um, in terms of the heat, there is, it's a pretty short book. There's one sex scene at the end and the sex scene was actually good. Um, I honestly wish that they just had like a different love interest though, because the love interest personality, I wasn't really feeling it. Like it was kind of like a, I wouldn't really say it's like a grumpy sunshine pairing with like a, a grumpy dude. Because like I felt like the main character wasn't really a sunshine character. But it was one of those things where it's like the guy is like broody and he's got family problems. Even though in this character's case his family problems really aren't 
that bad. Like from what I remember, they're kind of like run of the mill, like clashes with his dad. Um, and that's just like really not something I like in romance. Like I really don't like, that. <laughs> I really don't like the uh, dynamic with like the sunshine woman and the grumpy dude. I don't know. It's just like not something I'm into. Um, so if they had like some other sort of love interest configuration, I would have liked that last sex scene a lot more, but basically this book wasn't for me and I took a chance on it and I confirmed that it wasn't for me and that's fine. Um, so that was Awakened. And then the other book I read was for a book club. It was A Song Below Water by Bethany C. Morrow. Um, here's the cover. Um, this is like a YA contemporary fantasy about this girl who's, well, it's a black girl who's a mermaid and in this world, um, sorry, it's not a mermaid, she's a siren. And in this world, people really don't like sirens. They really don't trust sirens. Um, there's like a lot of animosity towards sirens and like a lot of political like history of like, um, control and propaganda against sirens. And so people at school don't know that she's a siren. Um, and in contrast to the sirens, there are um, the Ilocos who have sort of a similar like hypnotic ability, but in general, they are more well liked. Um, anyone can be an Iloco, but only black women are sirens. Um, and for this one, I generally read reviews before I read a book just to like get a idea on if it's like something I want to spend time reading or if it's like how high a priority is it for me to get it read. Um, and for this one, I don't know if it was good or not that I read reviews beforehand. Like, I don't know if it made me more critical going in. I know some people felt let down because like they thought they were going to be like black mermaids in this story. And like, there aren't many mermaids in the story from what I remember. But like, for me, I felt like the siren's ability is still tied to water. And there is another supernatural aquatic black character who we find out later down the line. And they're more like a mermaid-ish type character. So honestly, I was pretty fine with that. Um, and so that wasn't a disappointment for me. I think I just had trouble like wrapping my head around this novel. Um, so the first thing I read by Bethany C. Mora was this adult novel, Mem. It was like a alternate history sci-fi set in like 1920s Canada about this black woman who is a mem. Mems are basically memory extraction. So rich people can have this procedure done where they can have memories extracted from them. Um, so it could be like pleasant memories that they pass down to their kids. Um, it could be bad memories that they don't want to deal with. And um, those memory extractions are like real people called mems. And um, I was a little, I think, thrown just like by the trajectory of like Moro's writing because this was like a story where I was like expect, Mem was a story where I was expecting to see racism because of the time period and the setting. And for me, it was almost like distracting. Like I was like, did I like misunderstand like the character's race? Like, is there something I'm missing here? Um, at the end, there's an author's note explaining like why Morrow didn't want to talk about racism in this alternative history, um, Canada. I'm just going to like read the quote here to um, uh, just read the quote from the author's note because I don't want to try and sum it up. But Mara says, one aspect of Montreal and indeed Canadian history that I intentionally omitted is the reality of racism that was and is present. I refuse to be beholden to this ugly lit. I refuse to be beholden to this ugliness, stifling Elsie's existence even further by dealing with the accuracy of how her blackness would have been treated. Um, so in that book, ma'am, that was one where um, there's like this new class of people where like the race could have been tied into the story to like make interesting points, but uh, Mara decided not to um, discuss race at the time. Um, there really isn't an explanation given for in world, like why racism isn't an issue. Like there's no like 
alternate events where like Canada just isn't racist. Um, and it's just kind of like when you get to the author's note, it's explained why that approach was taken. Um, so I was like kind of surprised to read this one where it's like racism is so front and center. Um, I don't think it's like really a big departure in terms of like Morrow's writing. Like I think in between Mem and in between um, A Song Below Water, she did write like a, like a, a short story about like social issues and like protests and stuff that was in an anthology that I haven't read. Um, but like that was just interesting to me, like that change in, um, I guess, perspective or tack. Um, oh, hey, Kiki. Uh, Kiki says, ooh, I read Mem, really like that one. Although I still read colonialism into it. Yeah, like for me, I don't really know a whole lot about the history of like uh, black people in Canada. So I was like, oh, like is this character like someone from the US who ran North? Is she like an immigrant from the Caribbean? Like um, things like that. Like I was just like expecting like small details or something about her life or like her culture to be tied in somehow. And I was just like kind of lost when that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, it's a choice people make when they write. Um, and I really just kind of, it was a choice people make when they write. And for me, it was just like a transition going from like bad introduction to like, this is the book on um, this and this is a story now that's being told. Um, so in terms of like the aspects of the story, I did like, um, the two main characters are Tavia and Effie, and I really liked their sisterhood. Like, um, I really did like their connection. I felt like they genuinely cared about each other, and I liked how they like comforted each other and like how they hung out together. And I think my favorite parts in the book were um, Effie, who's not a siren, her Renaissance Fair gig. I don't know. I just I get really interested when like people tell me details about something that like. I should have thought to ask questions about, but like didn't. Like I never really thought about the inner world of like Renaissance fairs and like people who go to them like hardcore. And so it was like interesting because she's into that reading about her job and about like the fan fiction that's around Renaissance fairs. Like, I don't know. I'm like, I like, I have friends who play D and D. Like I look at dorky stuff online. And so I'll, I just kind of, thought that if like renaissance fairs like i just thought i would know more about renaissance fairs i really didn't know much of anything so that was interesting um i really felt for both tavia and effie in the story like i felt like their parents were really intent on doing things in their kids best interests um or what they perceived to be their best interests even when like tavia and effie were like this isn't what we want like this is hurting us like we need to find some other way to like solve this issue um, so that was like <laughs> frustrating and heart wrenching and uh, very believable. Um, I think for me, a big issue I had with the novel was where the like new stuff came in because I felt like the book really relied on you understanding like how um, misogyny and like racism and stuff work in our world, and I felt like things weren't established enough in the new world. Like I wasn't really clear on the hierarchies of the supernatural creatures. Um, like we really understand where the sirens stand and where the locos stand. Um, but there's like some other creatures that are alluded to and it seems like people are fine with them, but then it seems like maybe people aren't fine with them. And I got a little confused there. Um, like. Moro's talked about it in interviews. Um, what was it? Um, we had her for a solar powered uh, Q and A after a discussion of this book. So the Q and A is on Injeri's channel. If you want to check it out on Onyx Pages channel, and she talks about um, Moro talks about like using some of these um, creatures to like make commentaries on um, disability and ableism. And for me, like, I was, like, very interested in the things that Mara had to say, but, like, 
I was more interested in like the thought process behind the world than like what I actually saw on page. Like I felt like a lot of stuff didn't come through and I would have liked it to. Um, okay, sorry, circling back to this comment. Kiki says, I'm intrigued by what you'll think about Library of the Dead because race isn't a thing in it either. Yeah, I've been watching your <laughs> live reactions to it. Um, I don't really know anything about Scotland or the Enlightenment, so I think a lot of that stuff is going to just fly over my head because it seems like a lot of what you're pointing out is just historical stuff that I should probably know more about, and I don't. Um, oh, and I also wanted to apologize for what was it? Maybe apology is a overstatement, but I think in some live I had done, I'd been thinking about like um, how alokos are used in the story and how I felt about that um, and being kind of like leery of it. Cause I felt like at the time I first said it, I thought like maybe liberties were taken with, um, I guess the stories that shouldn't have been. And like in rethinking it really, the locos are pretty actually true to like the very little that I know about them. Like really the things that have changed about the locos are pretty similar to the changes that are made to the sirens. I think I didn't do a good job at like explaining my unease, um, which is that like, I think I get uncomfortable when we like see this like creature or anything I guess from like folklore um, like outside the US or Europe introduced and like it's just not from an author like from that region, like especially because I'm forgetting on what countries like tell local stores. I think it's from Central Africa, but just knowing specifically that there aren't a lot of reviewers from that area, there aren't a lot of authors from that area. And so like once stories like go out and kind of spread, like there aren't gonna be a lot of people to either author offer what um pushback or like critique or conversation or more, you know, nuance around certain things. So I think that's what I need to articulate, um, which I didn't do a great job of doing when I brought up, um, when I brought that up initially. So that was that. Um, oh, in terms of things like in this story that I also wasn't clear on besides the hierarchies, I wasn't really clear on like the networks for the sirens. So like the sirens, basically have a network of people who are supposed to help keep them safe and help them like hide from everybody else. But like some of the people in um, Tavia's network were like, really like, they were just so temperamental and they really didn't seem committed to the cause. And I was like, how did they get in this network? Like, how are these people picked? Um, like, <laughs> How do you, can you throw someone out of a network? Like, it seems like a pretty big issue if people are just like grandfathered in, you can't get rid of them. Um, so yeah, for me, I think it was like kind of like the smaller details of this world that I wanted to have like a little bit more thought or like detail put into them. So like it would make the world feel more like real to me. Um, oh, sorry, circling back to Kiki's comment about Library of the Dead. Ooh, it might work better for you then, fingers crossed. Um, and I think for me, um, what was really kind of like, I think cemented the, cemented like my, my view of the book was the ending. Um, there's a point where Tavia is a siren, right? And part of being a siren is that she can make people do certain things. Um, if she tells them to do something using her power, then they have to do it. Um, and at some point I felt like she crossed kind of a major boundary that could have had permanent consequences. Um, and like kind of by luck of the story, it didn't. Um, but I felt like that moment just kind of happened and then we were on to the next thing. And I felt like I needed some like breathing room to just like let that sit and like let that process. Cause I was like, whoa, that was like huge. Um, Tavia really hasn't done anything like this before. Um, I felt like I need to like sit back and like kind of reconsider what had happened. 
Um, and I felt like I didn't really get that space to just like sit in that moment. Um, I felt like things were kind of like rushed towards the end. And I think this kind of ties back to like feeling like the new hierarchies of the world weren't super fleshed out because um, Mara has talked a lot about one of the antagonists from this book, um, Naima, who is an Aloko. And basically people thought, I think that she was either the antagonist or something like that. And Mara thought that was overstated. She says white supremacy is the antagonist of this book. Um, and so the next book in the series is from Naima's perspective. And I think hearing that made me stop and like rethink some things about the book. Cause at first I was kind of like, I mean, for the first like two thirds of the book, Naima really isn't an antagonist at all. She's just kind of annoying. Like she just kind of pops up and insults people and then leaves. And it's like, this is just like petty high school girl drama. Like it's really not that serious. And then there's a point where it kind of on first read to me felt like it was actually like pretty serious. Um, and then I kind of had to stop and reflect. And the reason why I thought it was that serious was because there are certain like words that have like connotations in our world that, or in like ideas, I think that have connotations in our world that I just kind of apply to this one. And I felt like we didn't really get a chance to actually experience like this phenomenon for itself in the world um, by its own. I mean, that's really vague. I don't want to give spoilers for the ending. So like, I can't be more specific than that. But I'll give an example. So um, I can talk about part of it, I guess. So um, at one point, Tabia is worried about being outed as a siren. And when I hear the word outed, I think of like LGBTQ plus people. I think, you know, fear of being fired from work, possibly being disowned from your family, um, physical violence, things like that. Like very like real, not very real, very like immediate consequences for something like that potentially. Um, but like, I felt like in, but then when I had to like stop and think about it, I wasn't sure what exactly Tavia thought would happen to her because it wasn't, I didn't feel like it was really established in world what would happen if she was outed. Like, there is one person who was outed posthumously, so we don't really know. Like people were kind of just like, like they don't think well of them, but it doesn't seem like there's like an immediate like threat to her safety. And like Tavia at the time, like her parents know that she's a siren, like it, it's a hereditary thing. So like, it wasn't really like a, a secret. Um, so like, I think that kind of, like I think pulled me out of it. Um, at the end, it was just like, I felt like a lot of things were kind of like hinging on people's like emotional reactions to things in our world and just kind of like bringing that into like things in the world of a song below water without like establishing what's actually going to happen in a song below water. Because once I kind of like realized that I didn't know the consequences for what would happen if Tavi was outed, I felt like a lot more. I really questioned some of her actions a lot more. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I couldn't really make it all work in my head as well. Once I like asked, like once I started thinking about like what has been established in the world. Um, and so I think that was like my major um, critique of this book. Um, and I think there were things that could have been, I don't know, I think for me, like one, once I asked that, I was like, I kind of questioned how Tavia handled a lot of things, like I said, um, and particularly how she like thinks about herself because she's a siren, she's not like, no one really knows outside of her family and her network. So she is, there's like a lot of angst about how people will perceive her and a lot of fear and stuff. But I think also, 
I felt like at some points in the book, um, there were times where I was like, it seems like someone else has it kind of bad too. Um, I don't know. And I just kind of like, it, it, it kind of tied back to me not understanding the hierarchy of supernatural creatures in the world. I think that's really all I can say without getting into spoilers. Um, but I felt like when Tavia did cross the boundary, it was partially because she's so used to being like the only sign and the only one she knows and just thinking of herself as like, I'm the lowest of the low. I'm like, always, I have to always be on the defensive. I'm always the victim. And not really thinking that like, she can still like harm others. And I thought that could have been an interesting opportunity to talk about like that type of mentality and like the pitfalls of that mentality, but it just didn't really happen. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. I'm probably not gonna continue with this series um, unless I do, well, unless the book hub continues with it, um, in which case I will continue with it. Uh, the next book I read was Shadow Speaker by Nedia Korofor. Let me find the cover. Saw it ahead this time and pulled up the covers on my phone in advance, so there's not as much fumbling. And I got my screen brightness down. So this is The Shadow Speaker by Nettie Akorfor. This is like an early one by her. This is like, this was like one of the first, I wanna say within like the first like three or so books that she wrote. Um, it's like a middle grade, about 2070 Niger. And if you've read Zara the Windseeker by her, this happens like shortly after. You don't really need to read them in order, but it just kind of makes some of the smaller details make sense. And basically, um, someone in someone on Earth has like dropped some bomb that has like basically exploded the boundaries between the all these worlds in the multiverse, and it's forced them together and started giving people on Earth powers. And there's like cultural exchange going on between these different worlds in the multiverse, and it's causing all this chaos. And it's about um, I'm blanking on her name. Dang. Well, anyway, the protagonist is like a, a younger girl and she's um, she's a shadow speaker, which means that she can talk to the shadows. They can like tell her secrets. Um, she can kind of see the future. Um, and she basically learns that the world is gonna end unless she does something to intervene. And the story's about her trying to stop the world from ending. Um, I think my library shelved this as middle grade. It's an interesting space though. I feel like it's kind of a, I'm really not the person to ask about these age designations, but for me, I would have said it's like a more mature middle grade. There's like a decent amount of um, gore in it, like at least more gore than I'm used to seeing in a middle grade. And like, that's something I would like, maybe just check in with like a parent of my cousin if I was gonna hand them a book, but like, that's just me, like I don't, really know um i don't remember if a core what a core for said the age range was for that one um so in terms of what i thought about this book i was like this was like at the peak of me <laughs> me being checked out of reading so unfortunately i don't have a whole lot of um like good thoughts on it and also it's like a, a middle grade like i kind of just want to like sit and enjoy this one and like I don't know, that's, that's kind of why when I want to read middle grade, it's generally like, I just want to sit and enjoy the experience. Like I'm not really making as many real world connections or being like reviewer hat on and just kind of like, I want to have fun. Um, so in terms of things I liked about this story, I think I really like, no, I do really like how Nadia Korfer like writes about ethnicity um, in general. Like I, when she writes about worlds, um, I feel like they're usually like, multilingual, multi-ethnic. They're just like, feel very bustling and full. Um, and this one's no different. Um, I also really liked in the story, her thinking about like, what is ethnicity gonna look like in the future? Like in this book, there's a group called the New Tarig that I don't think exists today. And um, there's some like backstory on how this like new ethnic group formed that I thought was interesting. Um, what else? Um, I think she also mentions the Wodabe. Um, so it's like, I guess, points of interest. 
Um, the protagonist is Muslim, and I don't remember Faith being a huge. Oh, actually, no. That that's a that's a big um, falsehood. Faith actually is a big part of this story, um, because her father was like a Muslim like governor of the city, and he um, had like some very harsh like modesty laws and like very misogynistic laws. And he's like pretty like he's been like dethroned and he's like kind of hated and it's about her like living with this legacy and also like i think navigating um her faith for herself like figuring out what it can be like without her father um so like i enjoyed her talking about like those struggles um i liked the whimsy in the magical world like this is when the magical elements show up, they do return to the Uni kingdom from Zara the Windseeker. And so we get to see more of those plant-based buildings and the plant-based computers. And I, when I say like something's whimsical, I think it's more like a focus on like, wouldn't this be cool? Wouldn't this be neat? Wouldn't this look nice? As opposed to like making everything, like giving like a history and a lore for everything and trying to make everything seem like it fits together. like. Um, I just kind of liked just things being like loud and feel like they didn't have a limit. And, um, you know, it was like talking animals. There is, what else was there? I mean, honestly, some of the things that could talk weren't even really like animals or people. Like, I think there's like a talking windstorm at one point. Um, so I enjoyed that. And I'm very interested in how this is going to factor into her other writing because she said on Twitter a couple times that like all of her books are connected. And if you've seen my Twitter, I posted like a welcome to the core Vorverse graphic like a few months ago where I was like going through her tweets and like things I've noticed in her stories and things I've talked about with other people who've read her books, like trying to link together where everything fits. Um, and, and Jerry tagged her in that and so, Dr. Cole first saw that and she like told me some more info about how like other things that haven't come out yet like fit together, which is like made me interested to see everything else. Um, because it's not done yet. But this one mentions that there's a mul that this is a multiverse with like five worlds. And at this point, we've only seen stories on um the world of the Uni Kingdom and on Earth. And I'm wondering if eventually we're going to see stories on like the other three worlds in the multiverse. Um, I don't know, because it seems like everything that she's done for adults or like young adult has been on Earth. And it seems like only like the kids books have been in like other universes. So maybe it's like only going to happen if she switches back to middle grade for a little bit. I don't know. Um, sorry. Uh, AG. Is that one of like the non, is that the talking windstorm? Um, that's one of Jaws' husbands, right? I think we might be talking about the same person. I'm really bad at connecting names with characters. Like I kind of refer to them as the letter of their first name after they're introduced. Hey Kay, thanks for joining. Um, so I'm curious about that. And then there's um, a mentor figure, Jaw, who's kind of like part mentor, part antagonist. Like she's very larger than life. Like there's all this folklore about her. Um, she like, she's like ready to fight. Like she's a warrior, um, but she's very beloved by the people. Like she, I think was a governor of the protagonist town for a little bit and she has things to teach the protagonist, but also her and the protagonist butt heads because Jaws' solution to everything is to whip out her sword and try to hack whoever's opposing her to pieces. And the protagonist is like, can we talk it out? <laughs> can we maybe find another way? Um, so that like push and pull between them is very interesting. Um, hey, Brie, glad you could make it. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed this story, um, but like, I don't have a whole lot to say about it, I think. Um, and the next one is a poetry collection. 
which I'm also not going to have a lot to say about because poetry collections are hard for me to review. But it was Madness Like Morning Glories by Doris Davenport. Um, I really, really love this poetry collection. I think I mentioned it offhand once. Um, but basically, it's about life in this small Afrolation town. Afrolation is like, was it a Portman? Portman too. It's a couple words lumped together. Um, Afro African American and Appalachian. Um, I think it's. I don't think it's set in modern day. I think it's set in like the '60s, if I remember correctly. And basically, each poem in the collection is told from the point of view of a different person. So sometimes it's like a like an all knowing narrator. Sometimes it's like a person who's talking as if they're being interviewed. Sometimes the person who's talking is a ghost. And I really like just like the mixture of humor and creepiness. Um, like it's funny cause there's like all this like small town gossip and like some of the narrators like really don't like each other. And everyone has like a different perspective on like the same event. And so it was funny how they were like contradicting each other and also <laughs> talking smack about each other. Um, and also, I liked how the story was set up. Like for the first, like maybe third of the poems, there was kind of a story that's told and each person tells a different part. Like, I don't know if I'd even say, I don't know, it's like a person would tell like maybe like two or three sentences of the story and then they kind of like drop off and like the next person would pick it up. But when they picked it up, they might contradict something that the previous person had said. And so it was um, very interesting. Um, And in particular, I think the three like main like recurring items are like there's this man, Claude Gibson, who's kind of the there's a lot of stories about Claude Gibson, basically. Um his family kind of has a reputation and they're another set. And then there's also like this story of a self-propelled casket um that people have different uh interpretations on. And I think that's a self-propelled casket that kind of ties the whole thing together because it's brought up at the beginning of the collection then it's brought up at the end. And there's also like other recurring topics like elders and like um, sort of elders opinions and how they've like shaped the trajectory of the town and also like elders um, as sources of history. And there's some talk about like outsiders, like outsiders coming in and really liking the town outsiders um like who really like you know is like native to the town like um you know uh, i feel like that i feel like i didn't phrase that great um but you know like who's really from there you know like i don't know i feel like if you went <laughs> i feel like well you know when you like leave like a major city area um and you meet someone else who's from the city, they're like, oh, like, they want to know, like, really granular, like, oh, like, what what uh, school did you go to? What block did you grow up on? And, you know, if you're from the suburbs and you're not really from there. Um, so, like, there's those questions there, like, oh, like, this person showed up, like, in their 20s, but they've been here for 10, 10 years. You know, are they really from here? Um, there are, like, teachers who just kind of come in and, like, teach and then leave. Um, and I think they're kind of more generally regarded as actually being outsiders. Um, and yeah, I just really love the collection. It was just like a lot of fun to read. Um, yeah, I think it was really the, the really strong sense of characters that each of the narrators had that made me love it. It was spooky in parts. Um, there are some conjure women um, who have like a rivalry going. Um, someone says they put a root on someone else. Um, and honestly, when I realized that one of the narrators was, when I, like, I knew going in that some of the narrators were ghosts, but, like, they don't tell you who's the ghost. Um, and so it was, like, spooky when I finally realized, like, oh, my goodness, the person who's telling the story is dead. Um, so I like that part. And I really like this, uh, quote, um, from the poem. Like, it's not, like, I'll just say it. I really like this line, don't mess with the sacred, it will get you. I feel like that summed up the things I really liked about the collection. Um, so yeah, I would really recommend this collection if you like poetry. It was a lot of fun to read.
Um, he says, I don't know why I always forget to read poetry. Um, I feel like it's not something that gets, I don't, I don't know. I feel like it's not something that gets talked about a whole lot, you know? Um, like my experience was it, with it was I was forced to read it in school. I didn't like reading it in school. And then I kind of fell back into it because I had some friends who liked it. Um, but like, I don't, I don't think it has like the same pull, you know, as books. Like, I feel like people get into books. Like if you're not like someone who's like a dedicated reader, I feel like people get into books, you know, if a book is adapted for TV or for film. And so like, that's like a gateway to reading for a lot of people. And I don't know if that really happens with poetry, you know? I don't know if there's really like that gateway. Like I'm trying to think of like a poetry collection that I feel like everyone has read. And like, I know there are like big name poetry collections that people who like poetry are like, will tell you are very important and are very historical, but like, it's hard for me to think of like a poetry collection where I'm like, if I asked like 10 people, I'd expect at least one of them never read this poetry collection, you know? Erin says, I try to like poetry, but I just can't. That's fair. Um, I don't know. Um, it's something that's like growing on me, but also I, I feel like I wouldn't just like read any poetry collection, you know? Like I have some recommendations from friends. Um, I have some writers like on my list, but like I've definitely read some poetry collections that are like, where I'm like the writing is like really pretty and stuff, but like this just wasn't for me. Like I'm not super interested and I wouldn't read more poetry from this person. Okay, says ditto. I see a lot of people on bookstagram reading poetry and hyping them up, but I was forced to read it in school too. Now I like spoken word from time to time, but that was pre-shut down. I don't know if I ever got into spoken word. Like I know that was like a thing that was like kind of popular. Um, I'm like, I had friends who liked it, but I don't think it was something I ever super got into. Like when we had those poetry assignments in school, I always did free verse because <laughs> I didn't want to have to work with a rhyme scheme or like a, a structure or anything like that. So like, I I don't really have the, uh, the appreciation for poetry that some other people do. I'll just put it like that. <laughs> uh, Bree says, I love writing and reading poetry. Um, that's cool. I think it was Brit who says that like poetry is like the most like written form for people who like don't um like for people who don't write for a living. I don't know. It's been a while since I watched that video by Brit, but it's interesting that there's something very accessible about poetry, but also for some people it isn't. I don't know. Bree says my Angelou and Emily Dickinson was my first poets to enjoy. I feel bad. I have not read anything by Maya Angelou yet. I need to. Um, like Emily Dickinson's, wait, you, sorry, that's Dickerson. Let me look this up. Because the name sounds familiar, but like I could not for the life of me tell you a poem by her. And I feel a little bit bad about that. Like I've, I feel like I must have read something by her in school but I can't, like the only poet I can remember off the top of my head that I read in school was like E.E. E. Cummings and um, what was it? Do not go gentle into that good night. This is her most favorite poem. Hope is the thing with feathers is apparently her most favorite poem. And I, that sounds familiar, but I, I couldn't recall a line off the top of my head. Uh, Kiki says, I love poetry a lot, a lot. I think Salt by Nayira Wahid has been a getaway, sorry, gateway read for a lot of, of persons. Um, I wonder if I pulled up a cover of that, I feel I would recognize it. Does the name uh, Nayira Wahid sounds kind of familiar, but I don't know how I would know her because I'm not big in the poetry scene. Yeah, maybe I'm just making it up to, <laughs> maybe I just feel left out. I'm trying to feel like I'm in all with the poetry people. Um, Cause that, that cover does not look familiar. Bree seconds spoken word. She also seconds salt. 
he said, and Beyonce's Lemonade album got Larson, Shire, some shine. You're right, I forgot about that. I guess, mm, I guess if most people, I was gonna, I was gonna guess like maybe now that you said that maybe people have read Wars and Shire or like maybe who's it Rupi Kaur, uh, R U P I K A U R, who I thought was like making poetry on social media. I know there's a couple of poets on social media who people, more people might know about, and I'm just not in on it. Okay, says it had to be the right venue for spoken word. The ones I went to were jazz and R&B open mic with spoken word. I don't know. What was it? I went to one spoken word thing in college. Oh, um, where was it? I don't remember the name of it. Um, it was like somewhere in like some city's neighborhood, and. Yeah, I, I would just second that the atmosphere is very important because I think I'd read the person's poetry and like I wasn't really feeling it, but like, you know, you dim the lights and I couldn't drink at the time because I was underage and it was a college trip, but the people who were drinking looked like they were having a good time. Um, but yeah, I think atmosphere is really good for spoken word stuff. Kiki says, I feel like if you saw some of Emily's popular poems, you'd recognize them. I feel like I have to have read it because the name sounds so familiar. And like, I feel like she is one of those poets where like, if you're taking like an English class in the US, like she has to have come up at like some point, like I just can't place it. Um, Bree says, oh, Emily Dickinson had tragic life. E.E. E. Cummings, I carry your heart. Bree also recommends Milk and Honey. Aaron says, yeah, English teachers would always talk about how much thought goes into poetry when it was assigned to write poetry. <laughs> I always just threw something together a couple minutes and got A's. Yeah, that was my MO for the poetry unit. Um, I think I tried on like one poem, but like, I think the poem still ended up kind of, kind of busted. Like, <laughs> poetry is really not my go-to really hard to write structured stuff and I also like I, I remember my teachers tried to explain what is it iambic pentameter the thing where it's like the stress is on it this there's like a pattern with the syllables and it's like stressed unstressed stressed unstressed and like that's like important for some poems and like I could not for the life of me <laughs> make that make sense like I, I just kind of like squished how I said everything to fit the meter even though like if most people said it it wouldn't really fit the meter <laughs> like I just don't have the ear for it oh I forgot about Shel Silverstein um Shay says it was Langston who's in Shel Silverstein for me my poetry introduction I I forgot it's probably if people know poetry it's probably like Dr. Seuss and Shel Silverstein but I like I just blanked that they're poetry because they're like kids books. Um, what is it? Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. <laughs> I remember I had this like really weird book about like the missing piece where it's basically like this Pac-Man thing rolling around and it's looking for like the wheel of cheese where its mouth used to be. And it goes, well, grease my knees and fleece my bees. I found my missing piece. <laughs> Bree says, surviving home, recent read was good too. Chase says, spoken word is the best. Uh, Kiki says, right, Rupi Carr, forgot about her too. I, I'm probably just making stuff up about poetry. Like, I, I don't know, maybe it's just, I don't know. I might just be making stuff up about how much and where people read poetry because I'm not super plugged into it. Um, Rudy Francisco, wait. Is that the one that Britt Writerly likes? Because that name sounds familiar. Okay. We also recommends we want our bodies back. Damn. Do I have to, <laughs> Do I have to take notes? <laughs> Maybe I should take notes and read more of this poetry. I can, I can do that after the video though. I was gonna read, what was it? It was one about diving. 
I have a friend who likes sappy sapphic poetry. And I think it was Adrian, oh, it was Adrian Rich diving into the wreck. It's one my friend really likes and I was gonna read it at some point to um, talk with her about it. But I generally don't read poetry like that. Oh, wow. Emily Dickinson wrote over 700 poems in her lifetime, I think. I would believe it. He, uh, <clears throat> Kiki says, I want to get into speculative poetry more ever since I saw the award category at FiCon last year. Yeah, I am enjoying it. Um, who are some I know of? Like, if you're just going through magazines online that have sections of poems for free, I know there's Brandon O'Brien. Um, let me pull up his bio so I'm not talking out of my talking out of my ass. Um, I know there's Brandon O'Brien. Okay, who has some poems in um, Uncanny. I'll share my screen since I'm pulling people up now. Okay, so I know Brandon O'Brien does speculative stuff. I know there's also Therese Mason Pierre. Write some stuff online for free. I think she might also be an uncanny. And then I'm trying to think of who else. I think LD Lewis has like one poem up because LD Lewis usually does. Um, LD Lewis usually does like um, novellas and short stories, and then. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know a whole lot of speculative poetry. Uh, I think Linda D. Addison is one as well. Um, but it is a category I'd like to know more about and read more of. He says, OMG, yes, Shel Silverstein. That was huge in my prep school, private elementary. Oh. Shay says, yeah, I used to have to memorize different ones for speech competitions when I was in elementary school. <laughs> I, I had to take a public speaking class in high school and I was like, poo poo, when will I ever need to speak well in public? And now here I am with a YouTube channel, like darn, I wish I could speak well in public. <laughs> he says, um, yes, I want to thank Chloe has read some, but I won't swear for her. Um, Brie had asked if there was speculative poetry and this is in response to that. Yeah, I had read some. Um, I think I made a video about it for natural, ugh, National Poetry Month. Um, I spotlighted a couple collections. Um, but yeah, there are some. I just, I'm not super knowledgeable about it. I don't know what this scene's like. So I, I can give like five recommendations, but not a whole lot. No, Aaron says I had to write a screenplay in the style of Shakespeare. It was hell. I believe it. That is so a whole screenplay. That sounds miserable. Um, but if we're thinking of great Shakespeare screenplays, what is it? Uh, Romeo and Juliet. I forget who directed it. The one where Sid the Sloth versus voices one of the characters. Um, we watched that in high school and we didn't watch the whole thing. Um, cause I think there's like sex scenes and stuff in it. And so they would like cover up parts of the movie or they would turn it off for certain portions. But yeah, no, I would not want to write a whole screenplay as Shakespeare. Okay. Shay says I got the Randy Francisco. I guess correct. Shay says, I'm gonna have to come back and make a list of Bree Rex of Bree. Well, I'm gonna have to come back and make a list of Bree's Rex. Same. <laughs> no, you should. Um, you should definitely recite some of your poems on your channel. Also, you have a very nice reading voice. Um you oh. Kiki says, yes, I have Brandon's advanced reader's copy, but my Kindle died, so haven't read it yet. I should check out the magazines for real. I, I think all the poetry in that collection, I don't, I think that's all original. Like I'm not, I haven't read all of his 
all of his poetry by any stretch of the imagination. But um, like a lot of the titles um, of the poems like didn't sound familiar. Um, it's I have an arc too. It was funny because I'd just been like, I'd seen him uh, hyping it on Twitter and I was like, oh, maybe I'll pre-order that. Um, and I got on NetGalley and NetGalley had it available for download. And I was like, oh, I might as well, you know, just download it from NetGalley, get a review copy since I know I'm going to be reading it anyway. And so I'm working on that now. And it's been interesting so far. I'm just opening the the image in another tab so I can show you what the the book cover looks like for people who have not seen it before. Okay, so this is Can You Sign My Tentacle, which is Brandon O'Brien's, I think it's his first poetry collection that I'm working on. Um, the concept is basically that, um, I don't know what you call it, the Cthulhu's from Lovecraft's universe, but those tentacled peoples really like uh, rap and hip hop. And they are basically fans of various musicians and they're asking for their autograph or interacting with them in some way. And that's kind of the premise. There's like a couple poems about that. And then there's some other poems about different stuff. Like I think I just read a poem that was about NK Jemison and the Hugo Awards, if I remember correctly. So it's been a fun read so far. Um, Kiki says, I read Shivani Ramlukin's poetry book, Everyone Knows I'm a Haunting, hmm. which I found it was considered to fit into the speculative genre afterward. Yeah, I think also that um, there's kind of some like ways you might read speculative poetry and not realize it because like there are some people where it's like if the speculative elements are like a metaphor or like a simile, like you would, some people might count it, some people might not. Um, like I'm looking back on some of the poetry I read where it was like talking about like death as a person and like I might count that as speculative now and I wouldn't have thought of that at the time. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. Uh, da -da -da. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up on people's comments. In case says, oh, I hated my public speaking class in college. I didn't have to do it in college, thankfully. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like the most annoying class I had to take in college. I just had a, I had to take like technical like software classes for my major. And I just dreaded those because I had to go to the computer lab because like the regular computers in the dorm didn't have it. And my computer couldn't run any of the programs. And I just dreaded learning about the new software. And I always did like late at night when no one could help me and it was quite the pain. Oh, Shay says, well, no, I had a speech issue and it was part of my speech therapy. My grandma used to say that they never told her when she finally got me to start talking. Oh, I never stopped. Well, something similar with my brother. Um. Kiki says, I'm so glad my school didn't put a lot of emphasis on the poetry meter stuff. Oof. Her reading voice is super nice though, lol. Uh, I'm assuming we're talking about Brie and hyping Brie up to read poetry on her channel, which she should 1000% do. Erin says, I like the cover for, can you sign my tentacle? <laughs> Any class with a lab was my least favorite, honestly. I could write a mean lab report. So any, <laughs> I was usually very okay in the lab classes. I felt like the most, also, you, I feel like the people who don't like labs don't like group projects. Cause they're like, oh, there's gonna be the dead weight who drags me down. And like, <laughs> I was usually the dead weight dragging people down. So like, I love labs and I love group projects. <laughs> um. Ooh, did you have a Mac? Yeah, I had a Mac, so I had to get like, what was it? I forget what it's called, like the virtual computer where it pretends to be like a PC and then run it through there. And like, it always like set the fan on my computer going and it was, <laughs> it was just, everything took so long and it was so miserable. And it was just like so many, and like, I had to like use a password to log into the fake computer on my computer. It was just, 
It was a lot. Aaron says, I took a drama class to get out taking an extra math class. Um, let me think. I'm trying to think if I would have taken that option because I also was terrible at math. Um, like maybe not bad cause like I passed, but like it took so much work to pass. Like I was just living in the TA's office hours asking everybody for help. And it made me so nervous every time I could take a test. So I don't know if I would have taken drama over a math because I don't like public speaking and performing, but maybe it would have been just like a different type of bag. So I had to take like four math classes and maybe it would have been like nice to just switch up that dread for like a public speaking dread. <laughs> Shay, <laughs> I used to run out my computer, my programming classes to students with Macs. <laughs> That's smart though. Might as well. I hated mine because Kay was talking about why she hates labs. I hated mine because I was always stuck with the frat boys and the super brainiac who makes you feel dumb or the group where we could never get it together. I, <laughs> so I was like, my, the college I went to was known for programming and I was like, hadn't really ever done like actual programming before. And everyone's always talking about how great the intro programming class was. So I was like, I'll take an intro programming class. And it was like a big thing in my year because they were letting people have partners like before everyone had to do their assignments solo. Um, or you could get like, I guess, whatever the college version of demerits is for cheating. And it was a big deal because they're letting people pick one partner for the whole quarter in my year. And I desperately wanted a partner. I was like, looking out on the like class message boards. I'm like talking to all my mutuals in class, but I guess everyone had their partner pick like a week before class started. Cause I went like a full, like half the quarter before I could get a partner. I get a partner. I'm so excited. I'm so happy. I'm like, yes, I don't have to suffer alone anymore. Cause I was also not great at coding. And then I'm like, this is gonna be great. We're gonna put our brains together and we're gonna just blow through this code, blow through this assignment. It's gonna be great. And I get the partner and the assignment we did together, I was getting worse grades than when I was just doing them by myself. <laughs> it was such a mess. I didn't get a good partner until like the last two weeks of the class. I think the guy who teamed up with me eventually dropped out because he realized I could not help him either. So like dropped out of the class, not dropped out of school. And then I eventually got someone who was a good partner. Cause also to get to the coding class, you had to be like really good at getting to office hours on time. So it'd be like 10 TAs or so, because I knew it was like a lot of interest, but still you could get there and wait like hours to get a question answered. And it'd be like something really small. It took like two minutes and then you finish that and you like go for like five minutes of coding. You have another question and then you have to wait hours again to get your question answered. It was just so miserable. Uh, Shay said, LMAO is broke, so I definitely hustled in college. Oh, sure, you can use my laptop for $10, $10 an hour, bro. I mean, it's smart. Probably could have charged them more. Mm. I mean, you probably could have charged them more, <laughs> depending on who the clientele was. Uh, Aaron says, I hate group projects because I'm bossy. Nobody can do it right, so I just do it all myself. I'm, like, edging into that territory now, but only with, like, certain things. Like when it's time to organize family outings, I'm sometimes like, I will just organize everything because I cannot trust people to figure out when they're gonna get it in the car and blah, 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 blah. And like, I kind of micromanage now for some things. I was lucky I didn't have to work because my parents in school was my job. My parents like said offhand once that I had to get a job in college and so I did. And then they're like, oh, why'd you get a job in college? And I was like, because you said I had to. And they're like, when did we say that? So I had like part-time jobs, but it wasn't anything super major. I definitely did it more senior year when I had more free time. And it was just nice to have something where it felt like I was good at it. <laughs> Shay says, I could have upcharged, but I didn't really understand supply and demand like I do now. <laughs> what was it? There was so many things you could upcharge for, like what the textbooks, in my, I had classes where like, for like the really big like lecture halls for intro classes, um, 
they couldn't take attendance for everybody. So there's like this special clicker you had to buy and you would use that to like click in answers. Um, and that was basically how they took attendance. And so there was like a whole hustle around that. Um, yeah, college was a time. I'm trying to think, is there anything else I had to talk about? Okay, so I had a weekend job and a work study job. That's a lot to me. Okay, so that's such a blessing for real, for real, like it's a lot to work and go to school. Yeah, like, yeah, like if I had to have work work, I I don't know how I would have made it through the major because I was just like barely getting by some of those years. <laughs> okay, so I remember that clicker. Everyone past the middle aisles would dip. The damn clicker. And you were just like out of luck if you ran out of batteries. Like you, <laughs> you were just like in the glass and you had your clicker and you're there, but your batteries are dead or something. You were just kind of out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that was the whole thing too like people not having like weird like small things that like you just have around the house but like if you're like in college you might not like stamps or like that was another one I think batteries was one um I remember people would sell braiding hair a lot too like they bought too much braiding hair and they didn't want to use it all so they'd try and sell braiding hair um yeah, it's just like interesting <laughs> what people will sell when there's a demand for it. Um, I think I have one last book to talk about. That's the wrong tab. I think the last book was a self-help book, Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health by Dr. Rashida Walker. Cover. Um, and in terms of what I thought of it, it kind of wasn't super useful for me. I think the target audience were people who are like, don't know anyone who's been to therapy, very resistant to going to therapy. Um, and I think the focus is also on people who are like trying to get diagnosed for something. Um, so in general, I kind of realized that I wasn't the target audience for some of this stuff. And I think it also assumed that like, there's a lot of stuff that you would need to be told about like mental health and like, um, you know, sort of like things about how like dealing with racism will affect your mental health and stuff like that, where it's like, um, I don't know if it's just as a result of being online too much or if like in college, if I feel, if I feel like there's like a push around that, but like, I felt like there's a lot of stuff that I kind of knew already. So like, it's like a good entry book and also good for like some of the other things I mentioned, but like for me, I didn't get too much out of it. Um, I think the, the, um, the author is also Christian and is like talking a lot about, not a lot, but she discusses like faith and mental health. And there are some points where I felt like she was making assumptions kind of about like what black atheists want and need. And I wasn't really sure why she was making those assumptions or how she got there. Um, and I kind of would have appreciated if at some point um, there was kind of a like, an explanation of like why certain things around like uh, her religion were working for her, like a, you know, oh, going to church does this for me. And, you know, maybe you don't go to church or maybe like you attend some other sort of religious service, but here's how like modify this practice for your life. Um, I think I would have appreciated that. Um, and in terms of like, if you're someone who's like, oh, is this like, a, like a book that I'm embarrassed to get out from the library or um, I can't um, or I'm embarrassed to borrow it from someone. Is it worth like purchasing it for yourself? Um, I think it's a book where it's like the things you're going to want to get out of it are pretty easy to, like take notes on and like return it. Um, 
that's just like a thing I think I think about with like self-help books is like, is it something that you might need to consult a couple times? So I think it's like very much like a, you know, starting place. So like it refers to like, what was it? The, there's a directory. Um, I think it's therapy for black girls. It was like a podcast that was started around like six years ago, maybe four years ago, where it's like a black therapist is talking about, you know, what might you need? What, blah, what might you need therapy for? Stuff like that, kind of like um, demystifying, I guess, the profession and like the practices and all that. And she created a directory of um, black women therapists. I I think it's black women therapists, and so it links to that, which is useful. But you can also like a lot of the resources that I mentioned are things that you can like kind of take a note for yourself and then Google later and then get the full thing. Um, oh, Shay said back to the college. Hair itself is such a huge comp in college. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. The people who needed their hair braided. Well, it was, I don't know. By me, it was kind of like a trade. Like, the people I know who braided were like very, very nice about it. Like they were, they were not charging like market price for braiding, but also they were only braiding for friends um, or like people who like had a reference basically like a friend of a friend. But yeah, no, if you could like cut hair or you could braid, you were in business. Um, uh, Spree stuff, Don, she's back. Um, Kay says, I usually stay well away from self-help books. Uh, yeah, I usually do too. Um, this time I decided not to, I'm, I'm, very, res <laughs> I'm very resistant to self-help books. Um, I'll just, I'll just say that and leave it. So, um, I kind of knew that whatever self-help book I picked up, I was going to be like nitpicky about. Um, and this time I tried to focus on like, what are the takeaways? Um, and stuff and be more constructive about it but yeah um so yeah that's it she said yeah i'm in oklahoma and hearing what girls from texas was used to paying for braids child i should have learned sooner <laughs> there's also um my my college had like a kickback group like a a black woman kickback group and like someone like taught like how to do hair braiding and so that's how I learned. It's so, like I can't do it for other people, but like it was like a godsend. And <laughs> yeah, no, you could charge a whole lot for that because no one wants to it's such a pain to do it on yourself. Um yeah, I couldn't do it for other people though for money. Like it I did it my hair once and it took me like two days because like my arms got tired and I had to redo some of my braids like two times because I like my starts were bad and they were fuzzy. Um but no, if you're good at it, it's a lot of money to be made. Um, he says, I equate many self-help books to the, I'm assuming that's multi-level marketing. Yeah, I think I'm used to seeing self-help books that are, like, for, like, weird stuff. Like, <laughs> what is it? what's that one book that everyone's always dragging? Was it, like, 48 Laws of Power or whatever? Like, I'm used to seeing stuff like that. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I don't know. I Kate. No, I don't. I don't usually read self help books, but this was an exception. Shay said, uh, "I don't know if I like self help books, but I'm a John C. Maxwell fan for like business topics. I don't know what that counts as." Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, I I probably should read some books on money management. It just, uh, it's just so adult. Yeah, that's what I don't understand a lot of it. So I usually like 
mooch off my dad for like help and do whatever he does, but I really should try and understand that. Uh, I but like I think business stuff is kind of self helpy too. Like if it's I don't I feel like unless it's like a I don't know. I'm not super set on the difference between like self help books versus like skill learning books, but I it could be either. Cases I see people drag that one in the wash your face one. I thought the marketing one for the wash your face one was super duper weird. I think I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> I actually haven't seen people talk about. I felt like there was like a brief roast of that one, and then it kind of went away. But I feel like every time people are making memes about books they don't like, I feel like Forty Eight Laws of Power comes up pretty consistently. Um. So that was everything I was gonna talk about today. Uh, I'll stick around until like 8.20 to see if people had like any last comments or just filtering in to talk about, but. Um, if there's, if that's, if people are like, you know, done, I will log out at 8.20. Um, okay, so that's why I was like, I don't know, well, the line is a little blurry for me. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's more, if it's like for writing a business, it seems like more like a skill thing to me as opposed to like, I don't know, for me, if it's like a personal finance type book, I would pretty squarely call that self-help. Oof. I feel like getting older is just finding all these things that didn't used to hurt when you were a kid that just randomly started hurting. Like, I'm not that old yet, but like I'm I'm getting gray hairs already. But that's like also genetic. Like women in my family tend to get gray hairs earlier. But oh, gosh, I didn't realize that drinking too much water could also hurt. I always forget and then I do it. Such a pain. She says, nice wrap up. Definitely curious about reading a song below water. Like, I think there are people who really like the song below water and then people who were kind of meh on it. Um, I felt like the opinions were more divided on that one. It says, yeah, I agree. Finances and certain adulting ones are okay. I feel like it has to be like hard skills. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't want random like relationship advice from a stranger. That has to be from someone I trust. <laughs> <laughs> wait till you hit 30 uh no <laughs> no maybe if i get my act together now things will stop <laughs> uh, no <laughs> omg who are you telling i have to stretch every day like i should but i don't have to and I would really like to stay in the just should region, but I think I can already tell. Like I've been creaky forever. Like even when I was in my best shape in high school, like on track, running every day, stretching every day, I still like had random like, like my ankles, like I'd always roll my ankles and crack them, but it's definitely getting <laughs> worse now that I'm sedentary. 30 is definitely a whole different ball game. I look forward to 30. I hear that I'm just going to be so much cooler when I'm 30. I'm going to be so much more confident. Things are going to make so much more sense. I'm not looking forward to things hurting. <laughs> um, I'm just going to skip to this one because it's going to be relatively in and out. I'm in my mid-20s. Um, yeah. So, like, I probably shouldn't be, <laughs> probably shouldn't be creaking as much as I do, considering that I'm in my mid-20s, but and I probably shouldn't be getting gray hair as my mid-20s, but it's what it is. Uh, <laughs> and it says, my knees have turned on me for real. 
My knees are still fine. I do still have my knees. That is one thing to be grateful for. <laughs> Though I did have a, <laughs> I did have a thing where I was like, there's my, uh, the county I live in has like a free compost pile. And I was putting in, um, I fill up a trash can full of compost and like use it like about two or three times a week. And I was going in to fill the thing up with compost. And the compost is like kind of a pain to lift because it's like, it's like shredded leaves and like bark. So it's a little heavy and also it holds water. So like if it rains like two days or so, like it won't dry out in two days. So that'll add weight to it. So I'm like shoveling this <laughs> trash can full of compost, trying to be a good human. Like, oh, right. We're going to lift with our legs not our back avoiding back injuries and i lifted with my legs and i still felt like i almost pulled a hammy <laughs> it's just a mess uh kiki said are you interested in mara's little women retelling um i'm not sure um i think it's going to, I think from what I remember, it's a YA historical um, fiction. And I don't have a lot, and I think she also has been referring to it as like a, I think she called it like a remix. Like it's not gonna be like a, hitting like the major plot points of Little Women. Um, it's just gonna be kind of in the same time period with like, I think similar characters like similar character types, I should say, like similar personalities. And it's like with a, a black family. And I think it was like, what, 18, mid 1800s, I think uh, reconstruction era. I forget where Little Women is set. <clears throat> so I don't have a lot of loyalty to like Little Women, the original. Like my library had like a really pretty copy of the original book. So I picked it up and I couldn't get through it. Um, I read a biography of Louisa May Alcott and like, it's just wild how interesting her life is. And then just how like, to me, like, I guess pedestrian, like every day her stories are. Um, like, I think she writes really well, but like, I don't think I've read Little Women cover to cover. Um, so I don't feel like the pull from that end. And it is kind of outside of my comfort zone in that like I did used to really like historical fiction, but like I, I'm not really reading it like that anymore. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, if the stars align, you know, like if I'm checking out from the library and it's on display, um, you know, and like I'm low on books that week, maybe I'll pick it up. But I don't think it's one, gonna be one of those books where I'm like making it like a priority to read, you know? Um, yeah, uh, maybe I should read her bio. Um, it's been a while since I read it. Like, I think it was in her teens, but like, I think her dad was like a Quaker or something. Like, like she was like had like this like childhood where she was like kind of raised apart from like other people, and like her dad was like very political, from what I remember. So I remember all that being very interesting, and like she had like a very unconventional childhood, from what I remember. But um. Right. Her parents are transcendentalists. I don't know what that means. And they were like friends with like people who became on to be big name writers like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, David, uh, Henry David Thoreau, and like Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So I remember it's stuff like that. Um, yeah. And then the people in her book are just, I mean, I think it was also publishing at the time. Like it was really only morality tales that were selling um, like, so I know there was like constraints around the themes that she could write and in terms of like the character arcs that she could give people, like, I know there's a lot of like scandal, not scandal, but like, there's a lot of like back and forth about like Joe's character arc in particular and like her meetings to be married to like someone by the end of the book in order for it to get published. But yeah, I <clears throat> wasn't super big on the original book and it's just kind of outside of my wheelhouse. So I don't know. Uh, Kiki said, I loved it as a kid, but I'm not invested. The remix idea makes it sound somewhat more interesting, at least. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
like, I don't know if Little Women has been done to death per se, you know, like, like I'm thinking of like something I was really into as a kid was like, um, Anne of Green Gables. Like I read the books, well, at least the first two that most people who read the series read. And then I watched like however many adaptations of the movie. Like there's so many adaptations of Anne of Green Gables. Like there was a cartoon. I think there's like an anime. There was like a super long like TV collection that I watched on VHS. Um, but I don't know how many adaptations of Little Women are out there. Like I know there was that one movie recently with Timothy Chalamet, the popular actor. But yeah, I don't really know what the landscape looks like for Little Women. <laughs> and it says a couple weeks ago I sneezed and injured my shoulder. I hate getting older. Ugh. Sometimes when you like turn your neck too fast and <laughs> strain your neck. Not a fan, not a fan. Okay. Kay says you're into um, the remix since you love Little Women. It'll be the first book that I read by her. Okay. I hope you enjoy it. Ryan says I've never read Little Women or seen any of the movies. I. I don't know why I liked Anne of Green Gables and not Little Women, because I feel like it's kind of similar. Like, it's not, there's some drama, there's like some drama, um, but in general, the story isn't, it's not like super duper high stakes, like the world isn't ending, you know? It's like high stakes for the character, but like in terms of like stakes in like something like fantasy or sci fi, it's like not as high. Um, writing styles pretty similar from what I remember, like very long sentences. But so I don't know why I didn't get into Little Women like I did get into Anne of uh, Green Gables, but I don't know. Okay, so Kiki says the Little Women movie market is saturated. She says no more. We don't need any more. Keep them to yourself. Um, Kiyo says, ooh, I love Danny Green Gables. I was obsessed. I almost considered applying to University of Prince Edward Island. That's funny. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't wasn't that bad. Like I also, <laughs> I was also so bad at geography. Like I don't think I connected, like I think I knew it was based in Canada, but I don't think I like connected like, oh, this is like where it is on a map, you know? Yeah. I just, I stuck with just reading and watching way too many adaptations. And it was such weird stuff to be watching as a kid too. Like those TV adaptations were slow. <laughs> like they were not made for children at all. It was like BBC masterpiece levels of like <laughs> filming and stuff. Like it was like well acted. And like, from what I remember, it was like almost like page for page from the book, but like, it is very funny the things that I sat down and watched as like an eight year old and like now the things that I just am like, <laughs> I don't have patience for this. It, did, it didn't grab me in the first five minutes. I can't be bothered with this. <laughs> um, Kay says off topic a bit, but how many days do you read or do you randomly read? Like I don't really have a, so I kind of have a routine just cause like I'm a person of routine but reading isn't really worked into that routine. Like if I'm, like if I'm going somewhere, like if, like back in the day when I was taking the, the SEPTA places, I was taking public transportation, I was reading every day on the train and that was that. Was that. Um, but now it's like a little more, it's a little different. Um, like I was considering like sometimes I have free time at work and I was like, oh, maybe I could bring in a book to work to read for like 30 minutes or so. But like, I don't know. I start reading and sometimes I'm just like, I don't want to stop. <laughs> like, It's kind of hard for me to like squeeze it into my day. So it's kind of like I mostly do it on the weekends now. Like <laughs> I'm also the person who like procrastinates tasks by doing other tasks so i'm like oh i need to wash the dishes i don't want to wash the dishes i'm going to read 
because that's important for my channel. It's, it's very important for my channel. I need to read for my channel. <laughs> so, like, I mostly read on the weekends now. About the Anna Green Gables adaptations, he said they were dead slow. <laughs> there were, I just remember, there were so many VHS tapes of those things. Like, Like I remember it was like one one uh, pack with like the two VHS tapes inside. Um and I don't think that was even the full thing of the first movie. It was like a quarter or a half of the movie. Like <laughs> there were just so many. Like it probably took up like a full shelf of the of the movie section at my library. I saw the CBC adaptation. I I would have to do some digging to find out what adaptation it was. I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> the whole episode about drinking cordial or whatever. They love the cordial. <laughs> Woo, what else do they always do? A whole episode of Anne talking to herself. Mm, she wasn't talking to herself in the mirror for a whole episode. Whole episode of Anne in a forest, like spinning in circles and going like, "Wee, isn't this pretty? Aren't these flowers gorgeous? This is my friend, uh, Francesca. Like, I don't know. I just remember she like really long names with lots of syllables. Um, yeah, <laughs> they would just be up to nothing. And that cordial sounded good though. I was kind of like, it's like, this sounds red and like fun to drink. I kind of want some cordial. <laughs> I don't know. Shay says, I don't think I've ever seen a film adaptation, but I have seen live performances. I didn't know that they did live performances, honestly. I didn't know there was a play for it. <laughs> probably for the best for my mom. She probably did not want to be sitting through all this stuff. <laughs> and says, what is reading? I'm in a slump. You don't need to be worried about reading, Aaron. You got better things to do. You're probably prioritizing other things in your life you don't even realize. Things that you don't realize are important. I don't know. I feel like that's what happened with me this summer. I was like, I don't feel like reading. And I was like, oh, but I'm spending all this time with my cousins. And I'm like, well, that is time well spent. <laughs> I'm thinking of Pippi Longstocking, not Anna Green Gables. So some respect on Anne's name. Anne and Pippi are very different. You know, Anne's hair isn't even that red. Red hair is hideous. Anne's hair isn't that red. It's like a nice brunette. Like a like a classy lady or whatever her little delusions are. I forget what she was, but I feel like Anne would be so upset that you thought she looked like Pippi Longstocking. <laughs> also, I thought Pippi Longstocking's thing was that she was such a tomboy. Um, I don't know if Anne would have cared about that though. Aaron says, I love Pippi Longstocking when I was a kid. It's funny, I remember seeing it, but I don't think I've ever actually read it. Like, yeah, like I, I very distinctly remember the covers for those books, but I, I never picked them up and read them. <laughs> Whole episode about her reciting Tennyson. Yes, there was an episode, it was in one of the, it was in the Netflix adaptation, where in her little flight of fancy, she either like ran away from home or she got lost somehow, and, like separated from her family. And she doesn't have money to get a train ticket to get back home. And so she's like writing up poems and trying to sell them to people on the street. <laughs> I was like, this is very on brand for Anne. Um, Kiki liked Pippi too. Okay, says, my reading is a roller coaster. Lately it's up, but that slump is approaching. My reading's kind of leveled out, honestly. Like I was in a slump for a bit. There's a bit where I was like reading, but I was like in a haze. Like I wasn't enjoying anything I was reading. I've been reading kind of constantly, like not a whole lot, like definitely not as much as like earlier in the year, but like I'm getting it done. And I think I'm headed into <laughs> a slump because I have some books I'm reading that I'm not enjoying and I should just return them, but I feel obligated to finish them. And it's, it's not. I know I'm just doing it to myself, but like I can't make myself stop yet. 
I think that's the good thing about the library. Like if I own the book, mm, if I own the book I didn't like, it would be so easy for me to just like forget about it. Cause I'd be like, oh, I'll just do it tomorrow. And there's like no reason for me to finish it. Cause it's like the library and they're like, we want to buy it by this time. I'm like all the time until it's due. I'm like, oh no, I should be reading it. Oh no, I should be reading it. But when it's due, it's just like out of sight, out of mind. There's that as well. <clears throat> Jay said, definitely in a slump. Grown is killing me and I know I need to uh, DNF, but I only got an hour left. Uh, I haven't read Grown. I thought people generally liked it. That's a, that's one by Tiffany D. Bleh. Tiffany D. Jackson with the big bamboo earrings, right? I remember the rollout for that was cute. <clears throat> like everyone got the bamboo earrings who have pre-ordered the book. But yeah, I mean, maybe if you just come back to it later, you know. So I thought Grom was also a tough read. So I thought it was like very similar to the R. Kelly stuff. He, he says Auburn about Anne of the Green Gables, lol. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is so bad. The things I'll remember, like I have not, I think it's been years since I read Anna Green Gables. Like, I think I reread it recently because my little sister liked Anne with an E and we were watching that together. And I was like, I wonder how the book stuff aligns with that. And I had a copy, so I read it. But like, I don't know why I know all these little details about this little white Canadian girl's life. And like, why is this like burned in my brain? <laughs> like I guess I just read it way too many times. Kiki says, no, just return them. But, 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 but Kiki, if I don't, I'm a quitter. If I return, I'm a quitter. And I'm not a quitter. I kind of am, but not when it comes to books. I will probably just return them because I'm like 100 pages in. And I feel like if I get to 100 pages and it's like not keeping my attention at that point, it's just like it's above me. Like if it's been 100 pages and I'm not feeling it, I'm not going to like it anymore. It's going to have a big strike against it because I wasted 100 pages of my time. <clears throat> oh, Kay's got a method. I've been constantly reading three books, one romance, one mystery, and one arc. <clears throat> That's good. I kind of just let my arcs pile up until, like, they have, like, this, like, basically, I let my arcs pile up until I get tense, and then I feel like I have to get into them. Like, earlier, I used to be really good about, like, reading them on schedule and ahead of time, and now I'm just kind of, like, they get read when they get read. Especially because a lot of the arcs I have now are ones I, like, didn't request. I just kind of downloaded them off the site, so I don't feel as pressured to have them read by a certain time. But I feel like I should try to mix things up because I usually just have... I'm really just only reading science fiction and fantasy for the most part, and so, like, that's always what's going on. And it's so hard. Um... I think sometimes, like, I don't feel like I have a lot of variety. I think sometimes that can be hard, too. Like, if I'm reading, like, a really dense fantasy and then the only other things I'm reading at the same time are also maybe not dense fantasies, but, like, kind of similar. Um, so maybe I should try that. I am branching out more, though. Like, I am reading more, like, nonfiction. Like, um, there's a flower show by me. And people will like press flowers to um, make like press flower like paintings and stuff. And they get like really elaborate. Like some of them are so elaborate, like they look like someone painted them. Like they don't look, you have to get really close to see the flowers to know it was pressed flowers. And anyone can submit. And my cousin and my aunt were like, it would be kind of cool if we submitted. And I was kind of, they, this, they just kind of said it on a whim. But I was like looking at like books about plants in my area that I just want to read for fun. And my library had a book on making artwork from press plants. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. So <clears throat> that's probably gonna be my main thing to jazz up my reading cycle. Okay, surprise, almost done with two. Congrats. Um, Jay said, thanks for getting that autocorrect again. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so I know the one you're talking about. Reading it for three months. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. I think for like 
Yeah, no, I've had books I read for that took me three months to get through, and sometimes I regret it. Sometimes it's not that bad. And yeah, I don't know. I think the longest it took me to get through a book was like 18 months. And I wasn't reading it every day. Like I'd put it down for like months at a time sometime. And I think the main reason I stuck that one out was like a big important literary work. Like, yeah, I don't know. For me, if I kind of can't blow through it, it's, I'm not really going to enjoy it. <laughs> I don't know. Kiki's a quitter. Shay says I need to be a quitter. Yeah. I'm making progress. Now I will return books to the library and say I can just get them out later if I so desire. So sometimes I so desire to get them back out. I think the... I don't have like one that's really giving me issues right now. I think I have issues when I have like arcs. Because there's, I think, a lot of pressure for me to, like, like the book, especially if I requested it. Like, I want to have good things to say about it. So I think that can also kind of put me in a slump when I have an arc and I'm, like, not sure how I'm feeling about it. And then, which I don't have that issue right now because I'm not really reading arcs. And then, but I am reading this, like, really thick, like, 500-page fantasy tome that I picked up on like the recommendation of um an author online. And it is just really, it's not like terrible, but it's just like very much not my thing. Um, like yay thick, like I said, like 600, five, I think it's 570 pages if I remember correctly. Teeny tiny font, margins aren't terrible. There are some margins at least on the page. Um, but there's like so many countries well, there's really only three right now that matter, but there's like a couple countries in the mix and it's like big on the political intrigue. So there's like a lot of names, a lot of motivations to keep track of. And so far there isn't a whole lot of magic. Like it could be like, if you told me this was set in some civilization from like, I don't know, 300 years ago and I just didn't know about it because I'm not good at history. I mean, I don't know if I would believe you because of some of the animals, but like a lot of the, a lot of like the life in the story just feels very um, familiar. Like I tend to like fantasy where it's like there's magic everywhere or the magic that happens has like a pretty big impact on the book. And like right now it seems like the magic is pretty small and like it's very well written. And I want to get through it just so I have like a point of reference um, for like this type of fantasy because I think it is like a this political intrigue subgenre fantasy is definitely something that's like a force to be reckoned with in like the publishing world. Like, you know, what was it? Game of Thrones, I guess, is basically this type of fantasy. Like people seem to really like it. So I want to at least like read one and try to understand it. But it's going to it's going to take me a while to get through it and understand it. <clears throat> Shay says, I'm trying to see what her book score is going into White Smoke. And part of me feels like I can't say she's one to two if I don't finish the third book. Lol. What is it? White Smoke. I think I was, I think Tiffany Jackson usually writes like contemporaries, which like aren't really my thing. So I wasn't really, I don't know a whole lot about her. But I think White Smoke caught my eye because I thought it was supposed to be a haunted house story. I'm gonna. That's not what I wanted to do. I'm gonna pull up the uh the cover so I can share it again for people who don't know what I'm talking about. But <clears throat> this is the cover for White Smoke, and so I'm like tentatively interested in this one because I thought. It's supposed to have supernatural elements in it. Um, but if it's more, I think, sh but if it's more like thrillery horror, like more like, I don't know, like there aren't like 
ghosts or something or like some undead entity or like something like that it's just kind of like serial killers and stuff i don't know if i'm going to be super interested in it so i think i'm going to like wait and see with this one to see what people say about it if i'm going to check it out but i like the cover <clears throat> and i yeah i don't really know what people think of her writing in general because i'm not really on that side of the book internet <clears throat> Kiki says, oh boy, I don't know if I can do too many kinds of those fantasies anymore. The tomes, that's be really good. Not a lot of magic is a no-no. Yeah, it's just really, it's just not what I like in a fantasy. And like, back in the day when I just had all this free time, I would read books I was like very meh on or that. I would take chances on more books, but now that my free time is a little more limited, my energy is a little bit more limited, I'm definitely, like, this is, like, this is the one, you know? Like, I'm probably not going to read the rest of the series because it's, like, all those, like, 500-page tomes. Um, but, like, I'm going to read this one because I got a recommendation and I want the experience and I'm just going to get what I can out of that experience, you know? Like... <laughs> I'm going to be honest, like, I I can't name a 500-page book off the top of my head that I read where I was like, yes, like, I was hooked through all 500 of those pages. This book did not need to be cut down at all. Um, I would read a whole series of books that are 500 pages long. Um, like, I'm very much a, I see 500 pages, and I'm, like, <laughs> side-eyeing it already. Like, this better be good. Um, yeah, I prefer the, like, I've, I'm realizing that I prefer the standalones and the, the quicker reads. Um, yeah. Shay says that um, White Smoke is a horror. Aaron Patton says, I've loved all of Tiffany, Tiffany D. Jackson's books, so I'm hyped. Chase says, it's supposed to be Get Out meets Haunting of Hill House. <laughs> Can I say I'm tired of Get Out comps? I, think they, I never think they remind me of Get Out. Um, Aaron says, if a black person wrote or directed it, it's Get Out. Um... Yeah, I, like, I'm not really on, I'm not reading a whole lot of horror. Like, I'm very much, like, dabbling right now. Um, but, yeah, I think, like, Get Out is to horror what Children of Blood and Bone is to YA fantasy. People are very, uh, very liberal with using that comparison. Kiki says lots of side eyes. Maybe I should be paid to try. You know, if someone wants to throw me some money, I wouldn't be mad at it, but <clears throat> I don't know who would be motivated to, you know, like, <laughs> like with that beginning, I already know it's not going to be a, a four or five star review. Like it's going to be one of those things where I'm like, this is good for what it is, but what it is just isn't for me. And I can't imagine who would pay me to get through something like that. But you do live tweet your stuff. So maybe someone would pay you to see your thoughts as you go. Okay. So, oh, wow. I, thought, I think I said I was going to wrap up at 8.20. So I think I'm going to stick around for like two more minutes. Um, catch up on any final comments that are filtering into StreamYard a little slow, and then I think I'll wish you all a good night. I'm trying to think of other thrillers that are out right now. I think it's mostly, what was it, Ace of Spades that I'm, that's coming to mind right now, but who's it? Farda. I'm forgetting her last name. Yeah, there's just like a lot of stuff I'm realizing that I don't read. Like I don't really 
Like, I think someone was asking the other day if, um, what people's favorite Dark Academia book was. And I realized they don't really read Dark Academia like that. It's just so interesting, you know. Book internet is just so specialized, and people have their little corners of it. And I just don't know about so much of it because I stay over in my little corner of it. Chase is not me realizing I don't know how to add people on Goodreads. Let's see if we can help you out, Shay. I don't know how to, truthfully, it's been a minute since I've added people. Goodreads isn't great for searching people, that's all I know. Yeah, navigating all the people on Goodreads is such a pain. I'm also starting to get spammers on there where they'll like leave a comment to something and then they have that like more dot 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 link that makes it look like the review just got cut off. But if you click the link, it takes you to like Amazon or something like that. Silly things such as that. Okay, yeah, the layout's not great. So, Shay, let me see if I can figure it out. Share my screen. So, you might have already tried this, but you're going to go into the search tab. You're going to type the person's name. I'll just put in, like, the first thing of mine. And it's going to be like, oh, you want a book? And you're going to be like, no, I don't want a book. I want a person. So you're going to hit the people tab down there. And then that's going to give you like a page of people. And you click on the person. And it should, you can either follow them just to see their um, reviews in your feed when you're scrolling through. Or you can add them as a friend, which will let you do messaging and stuff like that. So that's how you do it. I don't know if some people have that disabled or not. I don't really understand goodreads i don't think it's a like i said i'm not big on the interface for how you like talk to people and stuff i feel like that part is like very rusty oh you're on the app i'm never on the app best of luck shy i'm sorry oh but sorry <laughs> i didn't mean to click on that so um oh in terms of the get out comps uh the other black girl had a get out comp that's interesting i thought that was more of a contemporary Are people just comping that for books about racism that's interesting oh that's a thriller so i guess if it's a thriller about racism then it's getting that get out comp well you know, the publishing world's going to do one thing. It's they're going to wear a comp out. Um, so that was the live. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Um, it's been a long live. It wasn't planning on it being this long, but, you know, thanks for coming out. Um, and, right, I had a thing to talk about. So this Saturday, I'm going to be going live at, 7 p.m. Um, it's part of the Broken Earth read along. We're going to be doing sprints. Um, I actually read ahead this time, so I'm going to have would you rather questions or like those type of silly questions for the participants if you want to tune in for that. We keep the sprints, um, we try to keep the sprints no spoilers, but at this point, we're assuming that you've read the first two books. So if you haven't read the first two books, you might not want to join. Um, but just a heads up that that's happening on my channel. Um, really, that was it. I'm really not up to much. Um, I'm going to be 
I mentioned in my mid-year book freakout tag that I want to do more author interviews because that's something I haven't done at all this year. And it's just fun and it's easy content. And I've started talking to people about setting those up. So I'm excited for those. So those are coming down the line at some point. Um, probably more like September, October. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining me, everyone. I uh, hope you have a good rest of your night. Hope you enjoyed your time here. Goodbye. Take care of yourselves.